Brief Studies in Realism, 1, by John Dewey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Naive Realism versus Presentative Realism. In spite of the elucidations of contemporary realists, a number of idealists continue to adduce in behalf of idealism certain facts having an obvious physical nature and explanation. The visible convergence of the railway tracks, for example, is cited as evidence that what is seen is a mental content, yet this convergence follows from the physical properties of light and a lens, and is physically demonstrated in a camera. Is the photograph then to be conceived as a psychical somewhat, that the time of the visibility of a light does not coincide with the time at which a distant body emitted the light is employed to support the same sort of conclusion? in spite of the fact that the exact difference in time may be deduced from a physical property of light, its rate. The dislocation in space of the light seen and the astronomical star is used as evidence of the mental nature of the former, though the exact angular difference is a matter of simple computation from purely physical data. The doubling of images of, say, the finger when the eyeball is pressed is frequently treated as a clincher. Yet it is a simple matter to take any body that reflects light and by a suitable arrangement of lenses produce not only two but many images projected into space. If the fact that under definite physical conditions, misplacement of lenses, a finger yields two images proves the psychical character of the latter, then the fact that under certain conditions, a sounding body yields one or more echoes is, by parity of reasoning, proof that the echo is made of mental stuff. Footnote. Plato's use of shadows, of reflections in the water, and other images or imitations to prove the presence in nature of non-being was, considering the nature of physical science in his day, a much more sensible conclusion than the modern use of certain images as proof that the object in perception is a psychical content. End footnote. If, once more, the difference in form and color of a table to different observers occupying different physical positions is proof that what each sees is a psychical, private, isolated somewhat, then the fact that one and the same physical body has different effects upon, or relations with, different physical media is proof of the mental nature of these effects. Take a lump of wax and subject it to the same heat located at different positions. Now the wax is solid, now liquid, it might even be gaseous. How psychical these phenomena! It almost seems as if the transformation of the physical into the mental in the cases cited exemplified an interesting psychological phenomenon. In each case, the beginning is with a real and physical existence. Taking the real object, the astronomical star, on the basis of its physical reality, the idealist concludes to a psychical object, radically different. Taking the single object, the finger, from the premise of its real singleness, he concludes to a double mental content, which then takes the place of the original single thing. Taking one and the same object, the table, presenting its different surfaces and reflections of light to different real organisms, he eliminates the one table in its different relations in behalf of a multiplicity of totally separate psychical tables. The logic reminds us of the story of the countryman, who, after gazing at the giraffe, remarked, there ain't no such animal. It almost seems, I repeat, as if this self-contradiction in the argument created in some minds the impression that the object, not the argument, was undergoing the extraordinary reversal of form. However this may be, the problem indicated in the above cases is simply the good old problem of the many in one, or, less cryptically, the problem of the maintenance of a continuity of process throughout differences. I do not pretend that this situation, though the most familiar thing in life, is wholly without difficulties. But its difficulty is not one of epistemology, that is, of the relation of known to a knower, to take it as such, and then to use it as proof of the psychical nature of a final term, 
is also to prove that the trail the rocket stick leaves behind is psychical, or that the flower which comes in a continuity of process from a seed is mental. 2. Contemporary realists have so frequently and clearly expounded the physical explanation of such cases as have been cited that one is at a loss as to why idealists go on repeating the cases without even alluding to the realistic explanation. One is moved to wonder whether this neglect is just one of those circumstances which persistently dog philosophical discussions, or whether something in the realistic position gives ground from at least an ad hominem point of view. There is a reason for adopting the latter alternative. Many realists, in offering the type of explanation adduced above, have treated the cases of seen light, double imagery, as perception in a way that ascribes to perception an inherent cognitive status. They have treated the perception as cases of knowledge, instead of as simply natural events having in themselves, apart from a use that may be made of them, no more knowledge status or worth than, say, a shower or a fever. What I intend to show is that if perceptions are regarded as cases of knowledge, the gate is opened to the idealistic interpretation. The physical explanation holds of them as long as they are regarded simply as natural events, a doctrine I shall call naive realism. It does not hold of them considered as cases of knowledge, the view I call presentative realism. The idealists attribute to the realist the doctrine that the perceived object is the real object. Please note the wording. It assumes that there is the real object, something which stands in a contrasting relation with objects not real or else less real. Since it is easily demonstrated that there is a numerical duplicity between the astronomical star and the visible light, between the single finger and the doubled images, when the former is dubbed the real object, and the latter evidently stands in disparaging contrast to its reality. If it is a case of knowledge, the knowledge refers to the star, and yet not the star, but something more or less unreal, that is, if the star be the real object, is known. Consider how simply the matter stands in what I have called naive realism. The astronomical star is a real object, but not the real object. The visible light is another real object, found, when knowledge supervenes, to be an occurrence standing in a process continuous with the star. Since the seen light is an event within a continuous process, there is no point of view from which its reality contrasts with that of the star. But suppose that the realist accepts the traditionary psychology according to which every event in the way of a perception is also a case of knowing something. Is the way out now so simple? In the case of the doubled finger or the seen light, the thing known in perception contrasts with the physical source and cause of the knowledge. There is a numerical duplicity. Moreover, the thing known in perception is in relation to a knower, while the physical cause is not as such in relation to a knower. Is not the most plausible account of the difference between the physical cause of the perceptive knowledge and what the latter presents precisely this latter difference, namely, presentation to a knower? If perception is a case of knowing, it must be a case of knowing the star. But since the real star is not known in the perception, the knowledge relation must somehow have changed the object into a content. Thus, when the realist conceives the perceptual occurrence as a case of knowledge or of presentation to a mind or knower, he lets the nose of the idealist camel into the tent. He has then no great cause for surprise when the camel comes in and devours the tent. Perhaps it will seem as if in this last paragraph I have gone back on what I said earlier regarding the physical explanation of the difference between the visible light and the astronomical star. On the contrary, my point is that this explanation, though wholly adequate as long as we conceive the perception to be itself simply a natural event, is not at all available when we conceive it to be a case of knowledge. In the former case, 
we are dealing with a relation between natural events. In the latter case, we are dealing with the difference between an object as a cause of knowledge and an object as known, and hence in relation to mind. By the method of difference, the sole explanation of the difference between the two objects is the absence or presence of relation to mind. In the case of the seen light, reference to the velocity of light is quite adequate to account for its occurrence in its time and space difference from the star. Footnote. It is impossible in this brief paper to forestall every misapprehension and objection. Yet to many the use of the term seen will appear to be an admission that a case of knowledge is involved. But is smelling a case of knowledge? Or, if the superstition persists as to smell, is gnawing or poking a case of knowledge? My point, of course, is that seen involves a relation to organic activity, not to a knower or mind. Furthermore, the seen light is not in relation to an organism. We may speak if we will or if we must, of the relation of vibrations of the ether to the eye function. But we cannot speak without making nonsense of the relation of the perceptual light to an eye, or an eye activity. For the joint efficiencies of the eye activity and of the vibrations condition the seen light. End footnote. But viewed as a case of what is known, on the supposition that perception is a case of knowledge, reference to it only increases the contrast between the real object and the object known in perception. For, being just as much a part of the object that causes the perception as is the star itself, it, the velocity of light, ought to be a part of what is known in the perception, while it is not. Since the velocity of light is a constituent element in the star, it should be known in the perception. Since it is not so known, reference to it only increases the discrepancy between the object of the perception, the seen light, and the real astronomical star. The same is true of any physical condition that might be referred to. The very things that, from the standpoint of perception as a natural event, are conditions that account for its happening, are, from the standpoint of perception as a case of knowledge, part of the object that ought to be known, but is not. In this fact we have perhaps the ground of the idealist disregard of the oft-proffered physical explanation of the difference between the perceptual event and the so-called real object. And it is quite possible that some realists who read these lines will feel that in my last paragraph I have been making a covert argument for idealism. Not so, I repeat, they are an argument for a truly naive realism. The presentative realist, in his appeal to common sense and the plain man, first sophisticates the umpire and then appeals. He stops a good way short of a genuine naivete. The plain man, for a surety, does not regard noises heard, lights seen, etc., as mental existences, but neither does he regard them as things known. That they are just things is good enough for him. That they are in relation to mind or in relation to mind as their knower no more occurs to him than that they are mental. By this I mean much more than that the formulae of epistemology are foreign to him. I mean that his attitude to these things as things involves their not being in relation to mind or a knower. Once depart from this thorough naivete, and substitute for it the psychological theory that perception is a cognitive presentation of an object to a mind, and the first step is taken on the road which ends in an idealistic system. 3. For simplicity's sake, I have written as if my main problem were to show how, in the face of a supposed difficulty, a strictly realistic theory of the perceptual event may be maintained. But my interest is primarily in the facts, and in the theory only because of the facts it formulates. The significance of the facts of the case may perhaps be indicated by a consideration which has thus far been ignored. In regarding a perception as a case of knowledge, the presentative realist does more than shove it into a relation to mind, which then, naturally and inevitably, becomes the explanation of any differences that exist between its subject matter 
and the constitution of some real object with which it contrasts. In many cases, very important cases too, in the physical sciences, the contrasting real object does not become known by perception or presentation. It is known by a logical process, by inference, as the case of the contemporary position of the star is determined by calculations from data, not by perception. This, then, is the situation of the presentative realist. If perception is a case or mode of knowledge, it stands in unfavorable contrast with another indirect and logical mode of knowledge. Its object is less valid than that determined by inference. So the contrast of the so-called real object with the fact presented in perception turns out to be the contrast of an object known through a logical way with one directly apprehended. I do not adduce these considerations as showing that the case is hopeless for the presentative realist. I am willing to concede he can find a satisfactory way out. Footnote. This is the phase of the matter, of course, which the rationalistic or objective realist, the realist of the type of T. H. Green, emphasizes. Put in terms of systems, the difficulty adduced above is that in escaping the subjectivism latent in treating perception as a case of knowledge, the realist runs into the waiting arms of the objective idealist. And, as a matter of fact, it is extremely difficult to find any differences, save verbal and psychological ones, between contemporary propositional realists, as G. E. Moore and Bertrand Russell, and the classical type of objective idealists. Propositional realism I shall deal with in a later paper. End footnote. But the difficulty exists, and in existing it calls emphatic attention to a case which is certainly and indisputably a case of knowledge, namely propositions arrived at through inference, judgments as logical assertions. With relation to this unquestionable case of knowledge, the logical or inferential perceptions occupy a unique status, one which readily accounts for their being regarded as cases of knowledge, although in themselves they are merely natural events. 1. They are the sole ultimate data, the sole media of inference to all natural objects and processes. While we do not, in any intelligible or verifiable sense, know them, we know all things that we do know with or by them. They furnish the only ultimate evidence of the existence and nature of the objects which we infer, and they are the sole ultimate checks and tests of the inferences. The visible light is the evidence on the basis of which we infer the existence, place, and structure of the astronomical star, and some other perception is the verifying check on the value of the inference. Because of this characteristic use of perceptions, the perceptions themselves acquire by second intention a knowledge status. They become objects of minute, accurate, and experimental scrutiny. Since the body of propositions that forms natural science hangs upon them, for scientific purposes, their nature as evidence, as signs, entirely overshadows their natural status, that of being simply natural events. The scientific man, as scientific, cares for perceptions not in themselves, but as they throw light upon the nature of some object reached by evidence. And since every such inference tries to terminate in a further perception, as its test of validity, the value of knowledge depends on perception. 2. Independent of science, daily life uses perceptions as signs of other perceptions. When a perception of a certain kind frequently recurs and is constantly used as evidence of some other impending perceptual event, the function of habit, a natural function, be it noted, not a psychical or epistemological function, often brings it about that the perception loses its original quality in acquiring a sign value. Language is, of course, the typical case. Noises, in themselves mere natural events, through habitual use as signs of other natural events, become integrated with what they mean. What they stand for is telescoped, as it were, into what they are. This happens also with other natural events, colors, tastes, etc. Thus, for practical purposes, many perceptual events are cases of knowledge, 
That is, they have been used as such so often that the habit of so using them is established or automatic. In this brief reference to facts that are perfectly familiar, I have tried to suggest three points of crucial importance for a naive realism. First, that the inferential or evidential function, that involving logical relation, is in the field as an obvious and undisputed case of knowledge. Second, that this function, although embodying the logical relation, is itself a natural and specifically detectable process among natural things. It is not a non-natural or epistemological relation, that is, a relation to a mind or knower not in the natural series. Third, that the use, practical and scientific, of perceptual events in the evidential or inferential function is such as to make them become cases of knowledge, and to such a degree that this acquired characteristic quite overshadows, in many cases, their primary nature. If we add to what has been said the fact that, like every natural function, the inferential function turns out better in some cases and worse in others, we get a naturalistic or naively realistic conception of the problem of knowledge. Control of the conditions of inference, the only type of knowledge detectable in direct existence, so as to guide it towards the better. 4. I do not flatter myself that I will receive much gratitude from realists for attempting to rescue them from the error of fact which exposes their doctrine to an idealistic interpretation. The superstition, growing up in a false physics and physiology and perpetuated by psychology, that sensations perceptions are cases of knowledge is too ingrained. But, crede experto, let them try the experiment of conceiving perceptions as pure natural events, not as cases of awareness and apprehension, and they will be surprised to see how little they miss, save the burden of confusing traditionary problems. Meantime, while philosophic arguments such as this will do little to change the state of belief regarding perceptions, the development of biology and the refinement of physiology will, in due season, do the work. On concluding my article, I ought to refer, in order to guard against misapprehension, to a reply that the presentative realist might make to my objection. He might say that while the seen light is a case of knowledge or presentative awareness, it is not a case of knowledge of the star, but simply of the seen light, just as it is. In this case, the appeal to the physical explanation of the difference of the seen light from its objective source is quite legitimate. At first sight, such a position seems innocent and tenable. Even if innocent, it would, however, be ungrounded, since there is no evidence of the existence of a knower and of its relation to the seen light. But further consideration will reveal that there is a most fundamental objection. If the notion of perception as a case of adequate knowledge of its own object matter be accepted, the knowledge relation is absolutely ubiquitous. It is an all-inclusive net. The egocentric predicament is inevitable. This result of making perception a case of knowing will occupy us in the second paper of this series. End of Brief Studies in Realism 1 by John Dewey Brief Studies in Realism 2 by John Dewey This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epistemological Realism The Alleged Ubiquity of the Knowledge Relation At the close of my previous paper, I pointed out that if perception be treated as a case of knowledge, knowledge of every form and kind must be treated as a case of presentation to a knower. The alleged discipline of epistemology is then inevitable. In common usage, the term knowledge tends to be employed eulogistically. Its meaning approaches the connotation of the term science. More loosely, it is used, of course, to designate all beliefs and propositions that are held with assurance, especially with the implication that the assurance is reasonable or grounded. In its practical sense, it is used as the equivalent of knowing how of skill or ability involving such acquaintance with things and persons as enables one to anticipate how they behave under certain conditions and to take steps accordingly. Such usages of the term are all differential. They all involve definite contrasts, whether with ungrounded conviction or with doubt and mere guesswork, or with the inexpertness that accompanies lack of familiarity. 
In its epistemological use, the term knowledge has a blanket value which is absolutely unknown in common life. It covers any and every presentation of any and every thing to a knower, to an awarer, if I may coin a word for the sake of avoiding some of the pitfalls of the term consciousness. And I repeat, this indiscriminate use of the term knowledge is absolutely unavoidable if perception be regarded as, in itself, a mode of knowledge. Footnote. As I suggested in an earlier article, the conception of the ubiquity of the knowledge relation and all that has to do with a self is one of the things included in the term intellectualism, when that is taken in a pejorative sense. End footnote. And then, and only then, the problem of the possibility, nature, and extent of knowledge in general is also inevitable. I hope I shall not be regarded as offensively pragmatic if I suggest that this undesirable consequence is a good reason for at least not accepting the premise from which it follows unless the premise be absolutely forced upon us. At all events, upon the supposition of the ubiquity of the knowledge relation in respect to a self, presentative realism is compelled to accept the genuineness of the epistemological problem and thus to convert itself into an epistemological realism, getting one more step away from both naive and naturalistic realism. The problem is especially acute for a presentative realism because idealism has made precisely this ubiquity of relationship its axiom, its shortcut. One sample is as good as a thousand. Says Bain, there is no possible knowledge of a world except in relation to our minds, Knowledge means a state of mind. The notion of material things is a mental fact. We are incapable even of discussing the existence of an independent material world. The very act is a contradiction. We can speak only of a world presented to our own minds. On the supposition of the ubiquity of the relation, realism and idealism exhaust the alternatives. If the relationship itself is a myth, both doctrines are unreal because there is no problem of which they are the solution. My first step in indicating the unreality of both solutions is formal. I shall try to show that if the knowledge relation of things to a self is the exhaustive and inclusive relation, there is no intelligible point at issue between idealism and realism. The differences between them are either verbal or else due to a failure on the part of one or the other to stick to their common premise. 1. To my mind, Professor Perry rendered philosophical discussion a real service when he coined the phrase egocentric predicament. The phrase designated something, which, whether or no it be real in itself, is very real in current discussion, and designating it rendered it more accessible to examination. In terming the alleged uniform complicity of a knower a predicament, it is intended, I take it, to suggest, among other things, that we have here a difficulty with which all schools of thought alike must reckon, and that, consequently, it is a difficulty that cannot be used as an argument in behalf of one school and against another. If the relation be ubiquitous, it affects alike every view, every theory, every object experienced. It is no respecter of persons, no respecter of doctrines. Since it cannot make any difference to any particular object, to any particular logical assertion or to any particular theory, it does not support an idealistic as against a realistic theory. Being a universal common denominator of all theories, it cancels out all of them alike. It leaves the issue one of subject matter to be decided on the basis of that subject matter, not on the basis of an unescapable attendant consideration that the subject matter must be known in order to be discussed. In short, the moral is quite literally, forget it, cut it out. But the idealist may be imagined to reply somewhat as follows. If the ubiquity were of any other kind than of precisely the kind it is, the advice to disregard it as a mere attendant circumstance of discussion would be relevant. Thus, for example, we disregard gravitation when we are considering a particular chemical reaction. There is no ground for supposing that it affects a reaction in any way that modifies it as a chemical reaction. And if the egocentric relation were cited when the point at issue is something about one group of facts in distinction from another group, it ought certainly to be canceled out from any statement about them. 
But since the point at issue is precisely the statement of the most universally defining trait of existence as existence, the invitation deliberately to disregard the most universal trait is nothing more or less than an invitation to philosophic suicide. If the idealist I have imagined making the above retort were up in recent realistic literature, he might add the following argument ad hominem. You, my realistic opponent, say that the doctrine of the external relation of terms expresses a ubiquitous mark of every proposition or relational complex, and that this ubiquity is a strong presumption in favor of realism. Why so uneven, so partial, in your attitude towards ubiquitous relations? Is it perchance that you are so uneasy at our possession of an ubiquitous relation that gives a shortcut to idealism that you felt you must also have a shortcut to realism? If I terminate the controversy at this point, it is not because I think the realist is unable to come back. On the contrary, I stop here because I believe, for reasons that will come out shortly, that both realist and idealist, having the same primary assumption, can come back at each other indefinitely. Consequently, I wish to employ the existence of this too quoque controversy to raise the question, under what conditions is the relation of knower to known an intelligible and discussable question? And I wish to show that it is not intelligible or discussable if the knowledge relation be ubiquitous and homogeneous. The controversy back and forth is in fact a warning of each side to the other not to depart from their common premise. If the idealist begins to argue, as he constantly does, as if the relation to mind or to consciousness made some difference of a specific sort, like that between error and fact, or between sound perception and hallucination, he may be reminded that, since this relation is uniform, it substantiates and nullifies all things alike. And the realist is quite within the common premise when he points out that every special fact must be admitted for what it is specifically known to be. The idealistic doctrine cannot turn the edge of the fact that knowledge has evolved historically out of a state in which there was no mind, or of the fact that knowledge is even now dependent on the brain, provided that specific evidence shows them to be facts. The realist, on the other hand, must admit that, after all, the entire body of known facts, or of science, including such facts as the above, is held fast and tight in the net of relations to a mind or consciousness. In specific cases, this relation may be ignored, but the exact ground for such an ignoring is precisely because the relation is not a specific fact, but the uniform presupposition of fact. Imagine a situation like the following. The sole relation an organism bears to things is that of eater. The sole relation the environment bears to the organism is that of food, that is, things to eat. This relation, then, is exhaustive. It defines or identifies each term in relation to the other. But this means that there are not, as respects organism and environment, two terms at all. Eater of food and food being eaten are two names for one and the same situation. Could there be imagined a greater absurdity than to set to work to discuss the relation of eater to food, of organism to the environment, or to argue as to whether one modifies the other or not. Given the premise, the statements in such a discussion could have only a verbal difference from one another. Suppose, however, the discussion has somehow got underway. Sides have been taken. The philosophical world is divided into two great camps, foodists and eaterists. The eaterists, idealists, contend that no object exists except in relation to eating. Hence that everything is constituted a thing by its relation to eating. Special sciences indeed exist, which discuss the nature of various sorts of things in relation to one another, and hence in legitimate abstraction from the fact that they are all foods. But the discussion of their nature on sick depends upon etology, which deals primarily with the problem of the possibility, nature and extent or limits of eating food in general and thereby determines what food in general, uberhaupt, is and means. Nay, replies the foodist, realist, since the eating relation is uniform, it is negligible. All propositions that have any intelligible meaning are about objects just as they are as objects, and in the relations they bear to one another as objects. Foods pass in and out of the relation to eater with no change in their own traits. 
Moreover, the position of the eateress is self-contradictory. How can a thing be eaten unless it is, in and of itself, a food? To suppose that a food is constituted by eating is to presuppose that eating eats eating, and so on in infinite regress. In short, to be an eater is to be an eater of food. Take away the independent existence of foods, and you deny the existence and the possibility of an eater. I respectfully submit that there is no terminus to such a discussion. For either both sides are saying the same thing in different words, or else both of them depart from their common premise, and unwittingly smuggle in some other relations than that of food eater between the organism and environment. If to be an eater means that an organism which is more an other than an eater is doing something distinctive, because contrasting with its other functions, then, and then only, is there an issue. In this latter case, the thing which is food is, of course, something else besides food, and is that something in relation to the organism. But if both stick consistently to their common premise, we get the following trivial situation. The idealist says, every philosophy purports to be knowledge, knowledge of objects. All knowledge implies relation to mind. Therefore, every object with which philosophy deals is object in relation to mind. The realist says, to be a mind is to be a knower. To be a knower is to be a knower of objects. Without the objects to be known, mind, the knower, is and means nothing. Our result is that the difficulties attending the discussion of epistemology are in no way attendant upon the special subject matter of epistemology. They are found wherever any reciprocal relation is taken to define exclusively and exhaustively all the connections between any pair of things. If there are two things that stand solely as buyer and seller to each other, or as husband and wife, then their relation is unique and undefinable. To discuss the relation of the relation to the terms of which it is the relation is an obvious absurdity. And to assert that the relation does not modify the seller, the wife, or the object known is to discuss the relation of the relation just as much as to assert the opposite. The only reason I think anyone has ever supposed the case of knower known to differ from any case of an alleged exhaustive and exclusive correlation is that while the knower is only one, just knower, the objects known are obviously many and sustain many relations to one another that vary independently of their relation to the knower. This is the undoubted fact which is at the bottom of epistemological realism. But the idealist is entitled to reply that the objects in their variable relations to one another nevertheless fall within a relation to a knower, that is, if that relation be exhaustive or ubiquitous. 2. Nevertheless, I do not conceive that the realistic assertion and the idealistic assertion in this dilemma stand on the same level or have the same value. The fact that objects vary in relation to one another independently of their relation to the knower is a fact, and a fact recognized by all schools. The idealistic assertion rests simply upon the presupposition of the ubiquity of the knowledge relation, and consequently has only an ad hominem force, that is a force as against epistemological realists, against those who admit that the sole and exhaustive relation of the self or ego to objects is that of knower of them. The relation of buyer and seller is a discussable relation, for buyer does not exhaust one party, and seller does not exhaust the other. Each is a man or a woman, a consumer or a producer or a middleman, a greengrocer or a dry goods merchant, a taxpayer or a voter, and so on indefinitely. Nor is it true that such additional relations are born merely to other things, the buyer-seller are more than, and other than, buyer-seller to each other. They may be fellow clubmen, belong to opposite political parties, dislike each other's looks, and be second cousins. Hence the buyer-seller relation stands in intelligent connection and contrast with other relations, so that it can be discriminated, defined, analyzed. Moreover, there are specific differences in the buying-selling relation. Because it is not ubiquitous, it is not homogeneous. If wealthy and a householder, 
the one who buys is a different buyer, i.e., buys differently, than if poor and a boarder. Consequently, the seller sells differently, has more or less goods left to sell, more or less income to expend on other things, and so on indefinitely. Moreover, in order to be a buyer, the man has to have been other things, i.e., he is not a buyer per se, but becomes a buyer because he is an eater, wears clothes, and is married, etc. It is also quite clear that the organism is something else than an eater or something in relation to food alone. I will not again call the role of perfectly familiar facts. I will lessen my appeal to the reader's patience by confining my reiterations to one point. Even in relation to the things that are food, the organism is something more than the eater. He is their acquirer, their pursuer, their cultivator, their beholder, taster, etc. He becomes their eater only because he is so many other things. And his becoming an eater is a natural episode in the natural unfolding of these other things. Precisely the same sort of assertion may be made about the knower-known relation. If the one who is knower is, in relation to objects, something else and more than their knower, and if objects are, in relation to the one who knows them, something else and other than things in a knowledge relation, there is something to define and discuss. Otherwise, we are raising, as we have already seen, the quite foolish question as to what is the relation of a relation to itself, or the equally foolish question of whether being a thing modifies the thing that it is. And, moreover, epistemological realism and idealism both say the same thing. Realism, that a thing does not modify itself. Idealism, that since the thing is what it is, it stands in the relation that it does stand in. There are many facts which, prima facie, support the claim that knowing is a relation to things, which depends upon other and more primary connections between a self and things. A relation which grows out of these more fundamental connections, and which operates in their interests at specifiable crises. I will not repeat what is so generally admitted and so little taken into account, that knowing is, biologically, a differentiation of organic behavior but we'll cite some facts that are even more obvious and even more neglected. 1. If we take a case of perception, we find upon analysis that so far as a self is concerned in it at all, the self is, so to say, inside of it rather than outside of it. It would be much more correct to say that the self is contained in a perception than that a perception is presented to a self. That is to say, the organism is involved in the occurrence of the perception in the same sort of way that hydrogen is involved in the happening, producing, of water. We might about as well talk of the production of a specimen case of water as a presentation of water to hydrogen as talk in the way we are only too accustomed to talk about perception and the organism. When we consider a perception as a case of apperception, the same thing holds good. Habits enter into the constitution of the situation. They are in and of it, not, so far as it is concerned, something outside of it. Here, if you please, is a unique relation of self and things. But it is unique not in being wholly incomparable to all natural relations among events, but in the sense of being distinctive, or just the relation that it is. 2. Taking the many cases where the self may be said, in an intelligible sense, to lie outside a thing and hence to have dealings with it, we find that they are extensively and primarily cases where the self is an agent patient, doer, sufferer, and enjoyer. This means, of course, that things, the things that come to be known, are primarily not objects of awareness, but causes of weal and woe, things to get and things to avoid, means and obstacles, tools and results. To a naive spectator, the ordinary assumption that a thing is in experience only when it is an object of awareness, or even only when a perception, is nothing less than extraordinary. The self experiences whatever it undergoes, and there is no fact about life more assured or more tragic than that what we are aware of is determined by things that we are undergoing, but that we are not conscious of and that we cannot be conscious of under the particular conditions. 3. So far as the question of the relation of the self to known objects is concerned, 
Knowing is but one special case of the agent patient, of the behavior enjoyer sufferer situation. It is, however, the case constantly increasing in relative importance and from both sides. That is to say, the connections of the self with things in weal or woe are progressively found to depend upon the connections established in knowing things. On the other hand, the progress, the advance of science is found to depend more and more upon the courage and patience of the agent in making the widening and buttressing of knowledge a chief business. It is impossible to overstate the significance, the reality, of the relation of self as knower to things when it is thought of as a moral relation, a deliberate and responsible undertaking of a self. Ultimately, the modern insistence upon the self in reference to knowledge, in contrast with the classic Greek view, will be found to reside precisely here. My purpose in citing the above facts is not to prove a positive point, viz. that there are many relations of self and things, of which knowing is but one differentiated case. It is less pretentious, viz. to show what is meant by saying that the problems at issue concern matters of fact, and not matters to be decided by assumption, definition, and deduction. I mean also to suggest, but only to suggest, what kind of matters of fact would naturally be adduced as evidential in such a discussion. Negatively put, my point is that the whole question of the relation of knower to known is radically misconceived in what passes as epistemology because of an underlying unexamined assumption, an assumption which, moreover, when examined, makes the controversy verbal or absurd. Positively put, my point is that since, prima facie, plenty of connections other than the knower known one exist between self and things, there is a context in which the problem of their relation concerns matters of fact capable of empirical determination by matter-of-fact inquiry. The point about a difference being made, or rather making, in things when known, is precisely of this sort. 3. That question is not, save upon the assumption of the ubiquity of the knowledge relation, the absurd question of whether knowledge makes any difference to things already in the knowledge relation. Until the epistemological realists have seriously considered the main propositions of the pragmatic realists, viz. that knowing is something that happens to things in the natural course of their career, not the sudden introduction of a unique and non-natural type of relation, that to a mind or consciousness they are hardly in a position to discuss the second and derived pragmatic proposition, that in this natural continuity, things in becoming known undergo a specific and detectable qualitative change. In my prior paper, I had occasion to remark that if one identifies knowledge with situations involving the function of inference, the problem of knowledge means the art of guiding this function most effectively. That statement holds when we take knowledge as a relation of the things in the knowledge situation. If we are once convinced of the artificiality of the notion that the knowledge relation is ubiquitous, there will be an existential problem as to the self and knowledge, but it will be a radically different problem from that discussed in epistemology. The relation of knowing to existence will be recognized to form the subject matter of no problem, because involving an ungrounded and even absurd preconception. But the problem of the relation of an existence in the way of knowing to other existences or events with which it forms a continuous process will then be seen to be a natural problem to be attacked by natural methods. The question of whether the knowing event marks a qualitative distinctive difference in the career and destiny of things is a secondary matter, one that may be allowed to take care of itself once the problem is shifted from the alleged epistemological relation to that of naturalistic existences. End of Brief Studies in Realism 2 by John Dewey